And welcome into our Cubs Talk podcast brought to you by our great partners at Wintrust, home of Cubs Checking. I'm David Kaplan, and look who's our special guest today, former Cubs GM, now with the Yankees, Jim Hendry. My guy, I was telling these guys last night when I knew we were going to get to talk to you that in 2006, you're in Orlando. You've got money to spend, and you're all in to try and get DeRosa and Jason Marquis. And I call your cell, and you always add, hello. And I said, Jimmy, hey, I've got to go and have a heart procedure. Let me finish this Ted Lilly deal, and I'll call you later. I'm like, <laughs> what did he just say? Take us back to that moment. Well, it was a crazy moment. It's all true, but as time has gone by, I, it was true. I was on the, the gurney having a second EKG. And I was supposed to be back at the Scout of the Year banquet to present Tim Wilkin, uh, our great scout, scouting director from the Cubs then, with the Scout of the Year award. And I'd been having these chest pains for a couple days, and I, I kind of played it off as I thought it was a gallstone or something. Uh-huh. And, and uh, so anyhow, the, the real story was I was on the EKG machine when Ted's agent, uh, Larry O'Brien, called me and said, we got a deal. And... Uh, the, but I did not know at the time that, you know, two hours later I was going under. So that part of the story gets a little bit embellished. Yeah, not by me, but the world. But I, the, what I stop and realize is I, I still don't know why I had the phone in my hand on yeah, the journey. Yeah, you know? that's the other but thing. That, yeah. And what are you doing taking a call from me? Yeah, yeah. So I remember the doc like an hour before I said, Doc, I got to get to work. I got a deal going. Uh, if I'm hurting tomorrow, I'll come back. And he goes, if you go home today, you might not be back tomorrow. God <laughs> so I figured, well, okay, puts it I'm going to miss the banquet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. So you and the Yankees signed last night Garrett Cole for $324 million for nine years. And I remember you paid Ted Lilly four for 40 Yeah. And you spent, you know, a decent amount of money that offseason. Yeah. What you spent that offseason on all your guys was less than what you gave Garrett Cole yesterday. Yeah. Can you believe it? No, it's crazy. I mean, the world's changed. And, and I remember we were the Tribune company was being sold, and those people were great to me, Dennis Fitzsimon and Jim Dowdle before him, God rest his soul. So it was kind of a last-ditch effort. It wasn't the normal way we were going along in the system and all that, but we, we hit some bullseyes that year. And But I remember, like, thinking, man, I, I love Ted, but $40 is a lot of dough. But he, he ended up burning every penny of it, as you know. But it's just the nature of the world now. I mean, the elite players are, are you know, few and far between, say, or the really elite, and, and those guys are going to get huge dollars. And, and uh, you know, no, I don't know if a free agent pitcher – that's done any better up to his last couple of free agent years in a while than, than Cole has. So he's kind of what we needed. We've won 103 games on 100 of the year before. Tremendous job by Aaron Boone in the first two years of managing. But it seems like when we've gotten October, we needed that guy that there's your dude and he can go out there and win you a couple of games like, you know, like the Washington guys did this year or like Houston the last couple to get there. You know? I looked at the Yankee situation. Now you're working in it. And I said on the air earlier this morning on radio, look, it's just different. They've won 28 rings. It's the Yankees. And I don't care if one team came up and said, oh, I'll give you 325. The Yankees would be like, oh, I'll give you 350. Like, they weren't going to be outbid. What's it like working for them? Well, you know, what your point, maybe yesterday is well taken, but, I mean, Hal Steinbrenner really has, has done a, a really nice job. We've, we've stayed under the luxury tax now for three or four years. And, and in fairness to Hal, he's been criticized – for not spending enough money, like they're not like your dad was, and this and that. But he has a high level of fairness, and it's it's a really cohesive relationship between Brian and the Steinbrenner family. You know, Cash has been there 22 years as a GM in that market, which is absolutely unheard of. It's it's a pleasure to watch him work and be able to handle things, uh, you know, probably better in certain situations than I did. And, and last than 10 for me was a was was a good run, but a, a tiresome one. He's still fresh as a daisy. But it, we really don't flippantly. Maybe it was like that before I got there, but it's not like just went by at all costs. We've walked away from a lot of deals and, and been criticized for not being like the old Yankees. So I think we wanted to get Cole. I, I think in a perfect world, maybe we thought it might be eight for 280 to 300. So And Scott did a great job like he always does. And I, I think there were other clubs as we're hearing today that were in the threes. And we started feeling yesterday afternoon if we do get him, it's going to have a three on it, you know, so. It is what it is. Yeah, so, but he's, you know, and, and the kid came along with great success at the right time. And in, in fairness to him, I think he made up his mind where I want to go. And, and that's, you know, obviously we didn't know that. But obviously he directed Scott to, to get the best deal he can, but I want to end up in New York. 
So, you know, people in Chicago are like, what do you mean the Cubs are selling, you know, giving money back, getting under the luxury tax? The Red Sox have said we've yeah. got to get under the yeah. tax. Now the Astros are saying our owner wants us to kind of reduce payroll. Everything's cyclical, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And like I said, we've been under it the last couple of years, and, and there were times where we felt like, hey, if we can get this guy or that guy, and, and you just, you know, you have to respect ownership. The New York Yankees provide as much as I've ever seen for any player the amenities, the, we don't. There's the Steinbrenner family take all the excuses out of it. There, there's no reason why you shouldn't win or play well once you get there. If you can handle the the big stage, you're going to have everything at your beck and call that you need to be successful. Uh, I admire them the way they do that. They do that with the scouting department. They do that in the player development department. Uh, and I think anybody that ever played there would tell you that, you know, if you can't get it done, you can't get it done. But it's not because of you didn't have this or didn't have that. But that being said, you know, the, you know the the payrolls. Like I said, we're, we've gone in cycles, and I still believe that you should be able to win a World Series without, you know, just blowing everybody out uh, money-wise, and be able to do it under the the, the tax structure and, and the clubs that have been winning. They've done it without the biggest payroll sometimes too. So. So if you could go back and restart your Cubs career as the GM, mm-hmm. that was I think 2002. Yeah. Uh, like July of '02, I remember right. Andy came down. I think he fired Don Baylor, installed right. you as the right. GM. What would you do differently? Not in terms of individual moves. Yeah. What have you learned now that you go, "Well, I wish I knew that then." Well, you know, at first, the first couple of years, it started out in kind of a high fashion. A lot of things that we did were right, and, right. and certainly looking back, it wasn't because I was some genius. But one of those real lucky first GM jobs were like every trade we made the first year or two kind of clicked even they weren't big things you know it was Grizzlelanic and Carlos for Hundley or it was you know picking up Randall Simon or Glanville and then obviously some good ones like Ramirez or Derek Lee so for a while there I, I looking back I I don't know what I would have done differently the first couple years um, obviously when you look back with regrets I, I had to, everybody used to criticize the Tribune Company oh they don't do this they don't do that I have no issues with how I was ever treated by the Tribune Company and I believe that we had our chances to win. We didn't get over the hump. You know, we, we should have won the, in 03, the, you know, the Bartman game. And we were better in 04 and didn't get in. You know, so that's not anything that I would ever blame on ownership. Um, and then things got, you know, later on it was tough. Nobody's fault. The club got sold two right. times in four or five years. And it was a different world. But as a GM, you know, you don't make excuses or blame this or blame that. And even at the end, when it didn't go well, the Ricketts, treated me tremendously you know that that wasn't what they had in mind when they got there they thought Jim might be good enough to stay and at the end it was the right call and then obviously Theo is as good as it gets so getting back to your question I think I was you know I probably in in hindsight I would have um, maybe been a little more active uh, overseeing the draft um, before Timmy came Wilkin uh, back then, I was brought up in the school of you're the GM, hire scouting director. And let him do his Yeah, and deal. I don't think I would have been out there seeing 50 guys, but I, I was pretty much like, hey, if I'm going to evaluate you as a scouting director, i got to let you make the picks. You know, and now the world's a little different. I think Theo is more involved in the draft. Brian does a little bit more of the old school way, but we've got Damon Oppenheimer who's doing it for 20 years. And, and I t- didn't do it for sure when Timmy got there because – we had both done that job before that, and I always thought he was better at it than I was anyhow. But I think most of your regrets are, you know, like, hey, you know, maybe I shouldn't have signed that guy near the end or I took a gamble. Milton Bradley thing was a disaster. But structurally early, I had everything. Um, looking back, you didn't have a lot of personnel there, you know, but there was something to be said for that too of the less guys we had working, they had a big stake in it, you know. And, I, and Andy taught me that too. Like, we didn't have, like – you know, 10 extra people in the office working on arbitration like you do now. The world's changed. And I I wasn't as rigid as people think about being Joe old school, mm-hmm. but there were certain things I didn't adapt to maybe early on at the, you know, when it first was introduced. And and maybe, you know, I had Chuck Watson was really good. We probably should have expanded that department earlier. Um, you know, things like that. But in the overall, I mean, it was more good than bad. It was not real good at the end, and, and we can all make up reasons why, but it's 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 certainly – I put the onus on myself that when we did have our chances to finish it off – Didn't I mean, finish it. Yeah, and we should have done it in 03. So if you look at this current team, 
uh, you've got Javi Baez is arguably their mm-hmm. best player. You drafted him. Mm-hmm. And you look at Wilson Contreras. He's a two-time All-Star catcher, arguably their most marketable player mm-hmm. here at these meetings. You signed yeah. him. Does that give you some real pride that, hey, man, we left you guys some pretty good talent? Well, I, I, I don't look at it like that. First of all, I didn't run the draft then, so I give Tim Wilkin credit for Baez. Oneri Fleeter ran Latin America. So I, I always feel uncomfortable when GMs hang their hat on who they drafted. I mean, the, the, it's not like football or basketball. You know, there's such a gap between – our sport amateur league and the big leagues different than the other. So I, I think collectively, um, you know, Theo and I had such a good relationship before he got there. He knew when he got there that it wasn't some colossal mess. It was a, it was a tremendous job that he did. And I think we knew that it had to be kind of when we went a little crazy in the back load of deals when the Tribune instructed us to do that on the way out for them. Uh, I knew there'd be a price to pay down the road if you just didn't keep going with that. Like when we had the PV deal done, we couldn't finish it off because right. now the ownership was up in flux. Things like that. So I think you had to have a guy like Theo. If Jim Hendry stood up at the podium after 0, 10 and 11 or 9 and 10 and said, hey, we're going to kind of tear this down and, and we're going to be real good in four or five years, I might have the same plan, but that wasn't going to work for a guy that had been there nine years with no ring. Right. You know, Theo, Brian Cashman, Brian Sabian. Cache. That's what you needed to have that kind of, you know, guys with jewelry and great Hall of Fame executives um, to do it that way, and they, they, they executed it masterfully. Who is the biggest one, other than PV that you look back and go, son of I could have had that guy and I didn't get him? Well, you know, I, th- I think in hindsight, you know, I always wanted a, a better left-hand hitter. After we got beat in 08, um, or even going into 08, um, we were really good, but a little too right-handed, mm-hmm. and that doesn't all the way show up till the postseason. And we had a deal in place at the deadline um, for Raul Banez, and at that time, Jimmy Edwins was contributing well. Fugadomi hadn't hit the late-season skid like he, you know, about did to. a couple years, yeah, mm-hmm. in a row. Uh, so we had, we had, it looked like we were somewhat covered, but I kind of really wanted to, to do that, and then. Uh, I talked to Lou, and it wasn't like you know. It, it just, I think it was a, would have been a little uncomfortable for Lou as far as having too many guys for the same spot, so more guys would be sitting every day. Um, so it was just kind of we collectively decided not to, and uh, you know how that bites you. A couple weeks later, Fukudomi went down, and Jimmy was a little more nicked up. And then by the time we got to LA, you know it was Billingsley and Kuroda, and it made it awful tough on a right-hand lineup. So that. That team was good enough to win, as you know. I, I think we all thought in 08 the best two teams in baseball were the Phillies and the Cubs. Yep. And Gillick and I, Pat and I talked in September. We had this great series at Wrigley, like two games apiece, just four great games, and Pat's the greatest, Pat Gillick. And we talked at the cage the last day. He says, hey, I think we'll be doing this again a month from now, you know. And uh, that it, we didn't get to them, and they became the world champs. So those things kind of, I shouldn't say haunt me, but – bother me because the, the windows to win history would have been a little different whether it was 03 or 08 that you know it could have happened earlier than it did it just it didn't today now you're with the New York Yankees but we're looking around the industry and we're seeing managers who have never coached mm-hmm. have never managed Aaron Boone doing mm-hmm. it in New York uh, we saw the Cubs hire David Ross has never yeah. even been a coach do you like that trend well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not really opposed to it because we're talking about high-end people that were players um, that have a great way about them. And as you know, the world's different now. Sports are different now. Players are different now. You know, so uh, in the old days, it would have been like impossible for Jim Hendry. You're really a really good college baseball coach. When I got into pro ball, you know, people say, oh, you're going to try to manage someday in the big. I said, I've got no chance. I didn't play. I didn't play pro ball or, you know, that's not the way you're viewed. I wanted to get in. I did some time managing the minor leagues, but I knew my future in pro ball was going to be maybe in the front office. Nowadays, we're, you know, we're hiring guys to coach in college and take them right to the big leagues, you know. So that's a big change. But when you're talking about the Boons and the Rosses of the world, you're talking about guys that their whole pedigree is the game. Um, they have tremendous respect from the players. You don't have to be the greatest player that ever lived to be a great manager. The Jimmy Leland's of the world, to me, are 
you know, Bobby Cox, they weren't great players. Right, La Russa. So you just have to have that skill set, and that'll never change. I mean, you can get all the analytic information you want from upstairs, and it's very helpful, and you have to have a manager that's very receptive of that. But when he walks in that locker room, the 25 guys playing still have to know who's running that clubhouse. There, and, and those type of guys have that presence and still have great relationships with the front office. There was a great story that you told. So you leave Creighton where you took the team to the College World Series, didn't have the biggest budgets, and then you leave and go to the Marlins. Mm -hmm. And I think you were paid less with the Marlins yeah. than you were at Creighton. Yeah. And the first draft, they call you to the front of the room. Yeah, that's a great story. Gary Hughes, who is a lifetime friend, mentor, and Sam Hughes has been a great scout for the Cubs for years and now working with us. Um, Gary's the one that talked me into coming to the Marlins, and they created a great job for me. I really didn't have an interest in pro ball if it wasn't for the expansion possibility and Dave Dombrowski, Gary, John Bowles, all their hierarchy were like me. They didn't play pro ball. So it was one of those, well, if I'm ever going to take a chance, take it. If not, doesn't work out, I can go back and find a college job, you know. So I was in the first draft, and Gary in invited me. I didn't think that was anything special at first. And for the whole week, there's like six guys in the room. So we're, I've got all my guys from my area in Florida, and I had, you know, about six or seven guys, and we took a guy that I liked in the fourth round, so I'm all happy, you know. If you're going to scout and you've been coaching all your life, at least you want to sign the players. You right. know, it's kind of like your only Super Bowl day as a scout. So we get to about the 11th round, and there's like four or five guys up in the next couple rounds I like. So Gary calls me up to the front of the room, and, and I'm thinking he's going to ask me about, you know, Kaplan or Smith <laughs> or whatever. And he goes, hey, Jim, uh, would you do me a favor? He said, Cheryl's busy on the computer over there. He says, we're out of the fat-free Fig Newtons in the back. <laughs> would you run up to the Publix grocery? <laughs> and, I, and I must not have showed, you know, how disappointed I was. But I got in the car. I was going, you know, it's so pissed. And, uh, you know, three or four years later, the Cubs called and wanted me to be the farm director. And they, Andy McPhail called Gary Hughes. He said, oh, we love Henry. He said, he was Joe Hotshot, college guy. We put him through the ringer. I made him even go get Fig Newtons for me in the draft, and he wasn't even pissed. I said, if he only knew. But, yeah, it was a great story. And years later, when I became the GM, he sent me a huge box with about 25 packages of fat-free Fig Newtons. Oh, that's so great. <laughs> yeah, it's good. So yeah. great. You, know, you went in as the farm director. Right, and then became the scouting director. Andy asked me to change over and be the scouting director a year later and then the la I did that for about five years and the last two I did the together farm director and scouting director and then became the assistant GM when Ed uh, was let go and then Andy made me the GM two years later. And I remember walking down the hall where your office was mm -hmm. not your last office but the office when you were running the farm and doing the scouting and the Cubs had just traded for Matt Karchner and they gave away John Garland oh, and I tank. see you and I go <laughs> hey Jim how you doing? You don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, well, as a scouting director, you know, it's part of the business. And obviously, you know, Ed did what he had to do to get us in the playoffs that year. But John Garland, when we took John in the 97 draft, 10th in the country, he was the youngest player in the draft, the whole draft, and, and a first-round guy. So a year later, he was 18 in the Midwest League. And he turned out what we thought. We didn't think he was going to be Greg Maddox, but we thought he was going to be a solid. Yeah, and he pitched as a second, third starter for seven, eight years. But it, it was like when you're the scouting director and you're trying to get the thing going, and to be honest, when like a lot of people, when I took over the scouting director, our system wasn't good. And four or five years later, it became very highly ranked, and some of them didn't work out. But ranking-wise, we went from the bottom to near the top, and John was a big part of that already. And uh, I think the White Sox were just doing car wheels. Right. If you ask Kenny or Ron Schuler at the we time. We got who? We got Garland, yeah. So not to demean Matt Karchner, I mean, but when you're the scouting director and one year later, John hadn't finished a full season yet in, in the Midwest League, and it was like, he's gone. So when your GM calls you, he's yeah. your boss, yeah. and he says, hey, I'm doing this, do you at the other end of the phone yeah. go, are you out of your effing mind? Well, we did have a little exchange on that one. But, you know, like good people, you don't take it to the street. Right. You know, you put on your happy face, yeah. and, and, it, and if it gets you in the postseason, then, you know, you did. And, you know, back then it was the world's so hard now. Like now if everybody that doesn't hold up the trophy had a bad year or somebody choked or somebody didn't get. Back then, the, the difference maker in the game, not just the Cubs. Now, maybe not for the Yankees how great they were, but you had a good season if you got in the postseason. And if you didn't get in, you didn't have a good season, you know. And we weren't good enough to win the World Championship that year, but at the time – Ed's third or fourth year there, for the franchise's sake, 
it was Sammy Sosa's home runs and yep. pretty much it, and that at least put you back on the map a little bit. You know, yep. it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So in hindsight, it, it was a great deal for the White Sox, but those things happen all the time. Just like you know, Jeff Bagwell got traded for Larry Anderson, or you, we can name a hundred of them. A million. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, thank you for the time. You're welcome, Cap. You're great. the best. Thank you, brother. You were always great to deal with. You too. He is. He's the great Jim Hendry, the former GM of the Cubs, and now one of the top guys in the Yankee system. We'll take a time out on our My Teams app podcast, Cubs Talk podcast, brought to you by Wintrust. Thanks, man. Good. Good. You're Good. the greatest. Good. Thanks. All right, welcome back on our Cubs Talk podcast. A lot of fun talking with Jim Hendry. That guy is the greatest. Yeah, I got some big shoes to fill right now. Yeah. You got me after that? Unbelievable. <laughs> you can handle it. All right. All right, so the Cubs have not done anything yet. We saw the White Sox trade for Nomar Mazzara. Not a huge deal, but an upgrade over what they had in right field. Sure. Are you hearing anything on the Cubs with the news this morning that the Rockies will entertain offers for Nolan Arenado? No, I mean, honestly, yeah, it, sure, it affects the Chris Bryant trade market, but I don't think it really does that much. I mean, you're talking about a lot more money, obviously more years, too, than Bryant to commit. So it's a much larger commitment. It, it's honestly akin to the Anthony Rendon in free agency, but you'd also have to give up prospects or something else in return. So I think Arenado, you know, kind of falls at the bottom of the pecking order. It's still Rendon and Donaldson and then Chris Bryant after that and, and uh, Arenado after that. So I don't think it, it'll have a huge factor in the Bryant trade market. All right, here we are on Wednesday, and the Cubs have done literally nothing. Do you think now something gets done by tomorrow before they fly home, or you're pretty resolute that they're doing nothing? Uh, I'm even more resolute now than when I was telling you Sunday night or Monday on this podcast here. It, it's looking more and more likely that nothing substantial will happen. Uh, honestly, it's looking more and more likely that not even anything small will happen. You know, they, they were talking yesterday. Jorge was talking about, you know, maybe a, a adding a, a bullpen piece or some of the guys at the end of the bench. But I don't know if that's even going to be this week. It, it might still be next week or it might be January. There, there's still some things the Cubs have to wait on and figure out. So... For Cub fans who are sitting at home saying, what do you mean they're cutting payroll? Jim talked earlier that it's cyclical, and the yeah. Yankees went three straight years where they did not go over the luxury tax, while now they're obviously all in with Garrett Cole at $324 million. The fan at home doesn't want to hear that, but is it, in your opinion, being around the team, a smart decision that, look, if we're not at the precipice of trying to win the World Series, let's get back under the luxury tax and reset so we're not a repeater and then get after it again a year or so. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know that would be a very unpopular opinion, but I do agree with that. I mean, this is an 84-win team coming off of that season, and they aren't just one or two pieces away. They're, you know, they're not like, you had Garrett Cole, like, sure, this team is really, really good. I, I think it could easily make a run for the World Series, but as we talked about so many times in this podcast last year, they had so many holes they have to fill. Obviously, they have even more now with guys leaving the free agency. So you can't just throw money at the problem and keep doing that over and over again because that's where you really get yourself into a bind years from now. So right now, if there's ever a time to scale it back, I think that's it. So yes, I think only coming under the luxury tax threshold just because you don't want to keep being a repeat offender. And I think screwing up draft picks is more important than having to pay that tax that goes with it. So I think this now is the most important time. And then maybe 2021 and, and so on, they can retool a bit. Yeah, that's where I think it's at. And I know fans at home don't want to hear that. Right because they pay 14 bucks a beer and they pay that, second yeah. highest ticket prices and they're going to be you know, asked to support their TV and whatever else is out there. But it is a business, number one. Mm -hmm. And as Hendry said, look, you're still going to have plenty of money where, if you're one of these upper tier teams to win. You have to spend your money correctly. Yeah, I mean, 
you know, luxury tax is $208 million. Only three teams went over it last year, the Cubs being one of them. So, yeah, I mean, if you can't win on a $208 million payroll, then you obviously you're not doing things right. So, and that's not a direct criticism or anything of Theo and Jed. They, they say it all the time. They have to be better with the money they've had. Theo has said that for, for a year and a half now that, you know, they've got had more than enough money and financial issues to to win you know like that hasn't been the issue it's not like they're pulling back at the right time and even last year we saw that with Craig Kimbrell like yeah Ben Zobris money came off the books being on the restricted list but they still went out and offered Kimbrell money for for 2020 and for 2021 as well so the money has always been there when they need it maybe not as much to some fans liking but when you're talking a 230 million dollar payroll last year like like that's enough you know what I mean yeah, you should be able to win. Yeah. All right, well, we'll see you at Theo's media briefing later. White Sox also got good news. Hawk Harrelson's going in, so check out our My Teams app for the latest on Hawk headed to Cooperstown. For Tony, for Jim Hendry, for our great crew, we'll see you tomorrow on the Cubs Talk podcast brought to you by Wintrust live from the baseball winter meetings in San Diego.